Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Green, and with me is my wife, Dee. As we continue to work our way back, we believe the first thing to get back to is prayer. After 40 years of ministry, we know that prayer changes things. You're not alone. If you need prayer, call the MTC Christ is Center prayer line. Or submit your prayer request online, mtcfc.org. Remember, Remember we're, we're here, here for, for you, and, and we've, we've got, got your back. back. Well, praise the Lord, body of Christ in particular, MTC, More Than Conquerors, Faith Church family. Welcome to uh, our Labor Day, the second of our Labor Day impartations. Uh, this one we're calling uh, Boot Camp. Uh, by the way, I'm Steve Green, Senior Pastor of MTC, i.e. More Than Conquerors, More Than Conquerors, Faith Church, a family church, a Bible teaching center, teaching quality word, making quality disciples, producing quality fruit, a ministry that's reaching the world and this great city called Birmingham, doing that for the Lord. It's boot camp time. We're going to jump right in it so we don't waste your time. Uh, uh, you know, awesome um, uh, celebration of Labor Day and last week, the first of the impartations where we were talking about laboring for our labor, breaking money down. If you haven't heard that particular teaching, I strongly encourage you to go back from last Wednesday uh, and hear what the Lord had to say. But boot camp, more than Congress, army of God, let's jump right into it. Uh, this year's version uh, of uh, boot camp, and we'll talk about what that is, is called Got My Feet Shot. Got My Feet Shot. Or second thought, running with the vision. Not walking with it, not dragging and lagging, but running with the vision. And third thought, we're talking about we're going uh, uh, back uh, into service. Back into service. You know, one of the uh, 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 names for going uh, for military is called their service men. We're back in service. Whether in-person service, out-person service. We need to be in service. That's the only way we get angelic protection, right? But God says he will give his angels charge over you and to keep you in all your ways of obedient service to the Lord. Okay, let's jump right into the purpose. I know you're taking notes, moving fast, but we ain't moving that fast. Let's establish the purpose. The purpose of boot camp is to train the body of Christ, right? Or the army of God, where the body of Christ, both synonymous terms, the body of Christ is known as the army. It's one of the greatest armies uh, among countries and kingdom. Every uh, country want to boast about their military, about their army, navy, air force, marine, uh, green beret, and all that. Well, God calls us the body of Christ. So we want to train the body of Christ or the army of God. Uh, with principles. These are going to be principles. That means they're universal. Principles to effectively, say effectively, to effectively uh, 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 rage and wage war, wage war against the uh, adversary, against the uh, adversary. He's in a rage, but we are waging war against the adversary. Amen. Uh, in the last days. Well, Daniel chapter 7 tells us clearly in Revelation, Daniel 7 says there's going to be a time where the spirit of Antichrist will declare, Antichrist will declare war against the saints, and he will prevail until the ancient of days come. Revelation chapter 12 talks about a war going on in the heavenlies, uh, but it says, and they overcame him, or they conquered the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Amen. So that's why we're doing this boot camp. Now let's look at a couple of key scriptures. Uh, only one we will actually read out of 2 Timothy 2.1. That's our key scripture. It's going to fo focus in on uh, good soldiers. Oh, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 through 6, talks about an army that's under the government of the Son of God, the wonderful counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting Father. It says, every warrior's boot shall be used as fuel for the fire. So everything that the enemy tried to do to wage war is fuel for your next fire. We won't look at that. But it says unto us, a child is born, a son is given, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And of the increase of his government, 
there and peace there shall be no end. Also in Joel chapter 2, verse number 7 through 11, it talks about great, a great army. Amen. It says, and the Lord utters his voice before his army, right? So the Lord utters his voice before his army in Joel chapter 2. And it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm. I know that there are all kinds of sirens and alarms going on here right in my face if you can. I Perhaps you already are, but blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm uh, on my holy mountain, uh, and let the earth tremble because the army of God is on the scene, and the Lord will utter his voice. Verse 11 says, before his army, because his camp is very great. The camp of God is very great. And then, of course, in Proverbs 30, verse 31, all of these we will not look at because time will not permit. But Proverbs talks about a time and a season where that uh, gives a picture of a king. It says there's no better thing when a king or president or leader uh, has his army together and his army is with him. MTC, are you with me? Yeah, we are the church. We ain't going nowhere. I'm a, well, a lot of them said that. But I'm going to make sure you got your feet shot so you can... Uh, 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 began to endure the war that's coming against us. And then, of course, Second Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 through 13. No, that's not the funeral chapter where it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. That's the one that says be mindful uh, that you not keep company with those that walk disorderly, those that are out of order. I'm sorry. Part of the military is about order. It's got my marching order. Orders, amen. So please, in your spare time, read Second uh, Thessalonians chapter nine, verse number thirteen. But we're going to prepare to actually read Second uh, uh, Timothy chapter two, which talks about us being soldiers. I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. Yes, I am a soldier. As we get ready for this boot camp, spiritual boot camp here, this workers training, we're going to train our workers to uh, make sure they got their feet shot. Look at that scripture here in a moment. But Second. Timothy, the first of those key scriptures, we'll read that now out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, starting with verse 1 through 4. We'll begin to read that. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the son. grace. He's talking to sons. He's not just talking to servants. First part of war is, do you know who your spiritual father is? Therefore, my son, Paul's writing to Timothy, be strong what now? In the grace in that the is grace. in. It's going to take grace. You're going to need a lot of grace to win this war. In the grace that is? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me. The things you've heard of me. I'm not in competition with no other minister, but what did your pastor say? My sheep know my voice. The things you've heard of me. My sheep know my voice. Come right on in. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. I want to make sure you recognize the voice of your shepherd. The things that you've heard of me. What did you hear PG say? That's what I need you to remember. The things you've heard of me. Among many witnesses, many witnesses. the same co commit, commit thou to faithful men. Faithful men. We're going to commit some things to this army. You're going to have some battles in assignment, but we're going to commit them to not intelligent men. Come on, somebody. Not talented men, but to men that are faithful. Shod. Got their feet shot. To faithful men who shall be what now? Who shall be able to teach others also. also. So there's development. There's mentorship. Teaching others also. Now, watch what he goes on to say. Thou therefore endure hardness. Endure hardness as? A good soldier a good of good Jesus Christ. Soldier of Jesus Christ. Right? Not a crypt, not the blood, not the disciples, but a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the Amplified Bible would say as a first class soldier. So when you know you're in war, you got to have class. The late uh, Paul Bear Bryant of the University of Alabama Crimson Tide used to tell his players, uh, if you got class, everybody's going to know it. You ain't got to go strutting like the NBC Peacock, acting like you all that. Uh, we want to be, if you're going through, have class with it. Don't let the competition sing you sweat, talking about how bad things are. The dog ate the newspaper, and the uh, newspaper was late, and come on, and, and, and uh, uh, the newspaper caught on fire and set the house on the fire, and the fire set the trees on fire. Come on, somebody. The, uh, the fire is on fire, and the, before you know it, helicopter fell, fell out of the sky trying to put the fire out. No, if you got going through as a soldier, and you will, you will help out the scars, be classy in it. No, please, uh, keep reading there. No man that wharf entangles. No man that does what? Warth. In no man that what? Warth. Warth. War. It's a war going on. If you have it. Now, we're not just beloved, uh, a body of Christ. We're not in a 
a skirmish. We're not in just a fight or an altercation. Uh, come on, somebody. We are, in the enemy has declared war on the, our health, on our bodies, on our churches, uh, on our departments. There's a war going on, and you better fight. But no man that warreth, warreth entangle himself, entangles himself with the affairs of with this the life. affairs of this life or the enterprises. You cannot get caught up in your secular and forget that the reason you're here is to declare war on the enemy. So, so don't get caught up in your day job. What worthy of the vocation? Present your body. It's a war going on, and you're part of the body of Christ. And you're going to help us win the war, right? Okay. No man that warreth in the temple. Uh, you know, get entangled uh, in the affairs of the enterprises of this life. That he may please him who have chose chosen him to be a soldier. That he may please them that have chosen him. Why don't you thank God right now that you're part of the chosen? Amen. Many are called, uh, but few are chosen. And your responsibility is not to try to please everybody else but to please him that chose you to be a soldier it doesn't matter if people like uh, if Pastor Green appointed you over thing it don't matter if people like that or not your responsibility is to please him that chose you God gave me the orders I carried the orders out to you and everybody not like what you're doing in the choir they may not like what you're doing uh, uh, in the inner sense. they may but you're to please him that chose you to be that soldier Yes. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned. Cannot be crowned if he strive unless. Except he strive lawfully. Unless he strive lawfully. So that gets us started on about what this uh, thing is all about. Amen. So now let's go ahead and uh, talk about what this year's version is all about. This year's uh, strategy. This year's strategy for boot camp is to focus in on the armor of God, which means we have to have our feet shod. Okay, we're going to focus in on the armor, on the armor. Ephesians 6, the whole arm of God. That's what we're focusing in on, uh, which means we have to have our feet shod. With the gospel of peace. With the gospel of peace. You can't be messy. Can't have a whole lot of gossip and murmuring going on, backbiting and backstabbing with the gospel of peace, right? In order to win the war. In order to win the war. Our scripture we're going to look at is there is Ephesians chapter 6, a number 15. Now the whole armor, the pan-oplon, right? Pandemic, that's a war, right? Uh, a pan-America traveling. But uh, <laughs> the armor, the word Greek word for armor is pan, P-A-N, which means all up. Plon, O-P-L-O-N, which we get the word weapon, which means you must use all your weapon. But we're going to focus on just one of the weapons right now, and that's your feet shod. Uh, read Ephesians 6.15 as we move on. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Okay, now Amplified Bible is going to break that down, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everybody say the gospel of peace here. And having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness, mm. and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. All right. So there are five things mentioned in that. Read that one more time. One more time. Having, your sh having shod your feet in preparation, preparation to face the enemy. Face the enemy. With the firm-footed stability. With a firm-footed uh, stability. The promptness, promptness is a part of this warfare, and the readiness, readiness produced the of peace, produced by the gospel of peace. Now, now, next shade. There are five shades of meaning that goes with what we mean by feet shot. They're listed, right? It should be in your notebook on your screen. There, number one, you just heard them. Face the enemy. You must face the enemy. You can't be a coward and run from the battle. You must face. If people don't like you, they don't, uh, you know, every time I go to the MTC, seem like somebody say the wrong thing. You must learn how to face the enemy. Number two. Firm-footed stability. Firm-footed stability. Stability. Right? My picture right there on my feet. Firm for having those cleats. A Roman soldier right down to my feet there. Make sure they sing. I'll come and forget my face and forget the backdrop. Just drop down just a little bit. Because uh, what I'm accentuating right now is you got your feet planted. Firm. You're not here today or halfway in the front, halfway in the back. Firm. 
but its stability. Isaiah 33, 6 says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability. I'm firm. I'm like a tree. I'm planted at more than Congress. I'm planted in my department, children's worker. I'm not in one day up and down. I must be firm, and I must be stable. Number three, promptness. Promptness. And if I'm firm, if I'm here, I can't be late. I must be on time. Number four. Readiness. I must be ready. Ready for the battle. Ready, ready, ready. The re root, root word of readiness is read. Amen. Sometimes people are not ready because they don't stop reading how important it is that you give attendance to the word of God. All this is what feed shopping. And then number five. Gospel of peace. Gospel. It's not a gospel of prosperity. It's not a gospel of, of uh, increase. Uh, it's not a gospel of education. Uh, it's not a gospel of, of football. Man, it is the gospel of peace. Amen. That means the atmosphere, once you get here, you're not stirring up a bunch of stuff. Amen. So that's what we mean by the five uh, shades of meaning there. Let's go to our next lesson here. The ingredients of shod. Okay, the ingredients. There are ten of them. Is it ten of them? Yes, sir. Uh, ten ingredients of shod. They're going to sound alike. They're going to sound alike. Number one. Rod oh, protection. The rod. the rod of protection. That sounds to me uh, like uh, Psalm 23, rod of protection, right? The Lord is my shepherd. He's the chief shepherd, but his rod, the rod of authority, right? This rod, if you look at the Amplified, which we will not, Psalm 23 calls the rod, the rod of protection. That's what a sheep does. He drives back the wolves that try to come in the flock, your family flock, your job flock, the rod of protection. This is what shod being out of Psalm 23. Number two. Sod, green pastures. Sod. We're not talking about that little grass, you know what I'm saying, that, uh, you know, that's not a sod, it's not that rich Bermuda grass, but part of the shepherd's anointing is to lead you into green sod. Oh, we're not talking about sod or me. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah being a lot going the wrong direction. We saw in our opening uh, division of labor last week that part of what Joshua ended up saying was in, in Joshua 23, verse number four, that he was to give everybody their division uh, to what they were, their allotment. The character of Lot back in Genesis, he chose the wrong lot. Amen. And end up in sodomy. I pray that you'll stay connected to your Abraham and your spiritual father. And you will not end up in the wrong side. Sodomy, wrong city. Whether it's your profession or your career. So we must understand the side. Green pasture. Where the anointing is fresh all the time. So there's a rod, number one. There's a sod, number two. There's God, number three. Okay, yes, there's God, number three. And for the fool, Psalm 14, has said in his heart, there is no God. Number four? Nod. There's the nod, the nod, what that means. Uh, sleep. Some people just sleep. They're sleeping in church. they up all night. Uh, so they come here and they can't do what they need to do. Or they won't nod their head and say amen when you know it's the truth. So if we're going to have our feet shot, we must understand number one, the rod. Number two, the sod. Number three, the God. The fool says in his heart there is no God. Number four, we must, must not be nodded. But number five, uh, fodder. The fodder. We food. must understand the food. Uh, once again, back to that feeding. Part of the shepherd's responsibility in training workers is you must not just come to church when you're working do you still come to church to be fed i know way too many people that are very faithful in serving parking lot they serve uh, in ushers they serve in children's church but they're never seated they have lost their hunger for the word of god do you look forward to feeding time or working time do you look forward to the fodder to the feeding psalm 23 says uh, the lord is my shepherd uh, the word shepherd in psalm 23 is the word el roi a poor man a poor son not sons that are poised to leave, uh, but poeming, which means to lead, to guide, and to feed. Uh, are you hungry for the word of God? Can you, do you say, I can't wait when the Sunday that I'm not serving. Put me on the front row, not just watching and see who's coming in. We don't need those kind of greeters and ushers in parking lot and children's church that only come on their Sunday to sing. Are you hungry for the word of God? Because that's your life is going to be dependent on that. Man should not live by bread alone, but but by the fodder, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then number six. iPod. iPod. Communication. Communication. 
we communicate one way by church cast, right? Or by, by our church cast. We want to make sure that uh, we let you know what's going on uh, by communication uh, or by whatever device, Facebook, YouTube. Go back and hear these words. The pod, amen, that comes from this pod, uh, this podium, this podium, this sacred desk. Uh, do you look forward to hearing what God has to say and cast from this sacred desk. So there's the, there is the pod, and there is, a, of course, the podium, right? All right, number seven. Cod, fishers cod. of men. Oh, cod is fish. He says, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Our goal is to get every man, woman, boy, and girl, son, and daughter in the kingdom from nursery. Everybody's needed. Somebody, God bless the nursery workers. Uh, we need the uh, youth workers. Uh, we need the millennials, Walter. We need uh, the children's church, Shalinda. Come on, somebody. And all those, Sean Cook, we need all those that help out. We need the administration, D and Cheryl and staff and uh, Elder Thompson and all of us that help out and saying Rose. Hey, we need the music department. We need everybody, amen, to help us to win this. So that card uh, leads to what I'm talking about. Number eight. Body. The body. The body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The whole body is not where it's Pastor Green's thing. Uh, it's just a head. Well, your head ain't just leaving your body to itself. Your head need your, uh, needs your neck. It rests upon your neck, your beard, elders, deacons, trusting. Well, Pastor Green going out to respect rally, that's his thing. No, if we're part of the body of Christ, everywhere your head goes, your body goes, your arm goes. How you going to just sit my head over there and my arms and my feet don't go there? With me. I think you hear what I'm saying. Uh, you, we are the body of Christ. Number nine. Odd. Peculiar. Yes, yes, odd, odd, odd. Sometimes I know we seem a little weird uh, as I uh, kind of get a whole picture here uh, in this service of boot camp and the praises get so and I get the skipping and, and I get the dancing they get so good then I start the back and that thing moonwalking a little bit seems a little odd uh, it seems a little odd for us to be in service for three hours uh, but the Bible says uh, we're odd people and we were so odd that we will beat the odds when the devil come in uh, and the doctor come in and say you got a 90% chance that you're going to die your children will beat the odds. Your body will beat the odds. Your finances will beat the odds. But you must first understand that you are odd. Amen. That you are a peculiar people. A, 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 uh, that is a treasure, unique people called out of darkness. So yes, we're odd. And people call our standards uh, a little odd. Uh, uh, Ashley and Gerard and all those that's in the arts. Uh, uh, Danielle. Yes, it's odd for us to wave, just wave a flag like that. But you think we care? Yes, we don't mind being odd. Odd, amen. But if we're not odd, then watch this. It leads us to uh, number 10. Uh, pride. Pride. Sheep. Pride. Prodigal son. Prod, prod, prodigal. Notice it's called prod. Now the definition of prodding means to poke with a sharp instrument to keep sheep in, in, in shape uh, on, on their course. Bob Yandian, my mentor back in the early 80s, taught me this term of prod. I didn't understand that it was associated to prodigal sons. And I think we will read this over in Acts 26, 14. Sometimes we're prodding you, strongly suggesting you must understand the difference of the shepherd when we're giving you options, when we're giving you uh, sometimes suggestions uh, or recommendations. But we, when we start giving, when you hear me say, I warn you, or when you hear me say, it's a solemn assembly, how in the world, brother, trustee, elder, come on, deacon, a director's music department, how in the world are you going to be out of service, missing in action uh, when it is a solemn assembly? It says that's when you say, God, spare our people in, uh, in Joel chapter 2. And it says if we will repent, it, God will give us the means to serve. But he said no one exempt in Solomon assembly. Solemn, Solemn, not Solomon, Solemn, S-O-L-E-M-N, which means it's serious. Joel talks about that. When people are dying like dogs, he says, call a solemn assembly. We do that three or four times a year and tell everybody to, to be there. Matter of fact, uh, let's go ahead and read that and we'll look at Acts 26 and we'll move on because this is God prodding. And if you don't respond to the prodding of God, then you become a prodigal. What, what is that gal doing? A prodigal. You become a prodigal son. And there are two ways that we see that uh, in uh, Acts 26, uh, uh, 14. And uh, uh, we obviously see it in Luke chapter fixed, uh, uh, 15 where God is prodding. Let's go to that last scripture I mentioned. 
Yes, Acts 26 and 14, Amplified. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice in the Hebrew tongue saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you continue to persecute me, to harass and trouble and molest me? It is, a, it is dangerous and turns out badly for you. It's dangerous? Uh, I hear Paul's going, through, uh, Saul going the wrong direction. He's killing the saints. God's going one direction. He's going another direction. If the shepherd is leading us, we all go in the same way. We all at church on Sunday morning. We all in Solomon assembly. That's why I want to head in a minute over, over in Song of uh, Solomon, I mean, over in Joel chapter 2, where God says, spare my people, Solomon assembly. But we'll go ahead and look at this one first. Pride is when, when God is trying to get you to go another direction. And the shepherd is prodding you. It says it will not, it will turn out what now? It will turn out badly for you. It is dangerous for you, Amplified. It is dangerous and it will turn out badly for you after being prodded by the Holy Ghost. So as we are prodding sons, sometimes the word may seem a little sharp. It says what now? It is dangerous and turns out badly for you to keep kicking against the goads. The goading, the prodding goads, the pricks is what it's called. You kicking against the direction. God is saying Bible study. You saying remote. That is dangerous for you and it will definitely turn out badly for you. Now that's called prodigal son. You know what happened in Luke 15? That was a prodigal son, demanded his inheritance, took it, the father gave it to him. He wasted his life with riotous living. Then he comes back. After that prodigal living, after wasted, came back, broke as a joker. But the father had the fatty calf, the ring, and the robe ready for all prodigal sons that leave without being sent. Prodding is what they call that. Now watch Joel says. Sometimes God is prodding us because of the wars in the last days. We'll do things like Zechariah prayer. All families need to be here. A through Z. We'll prod you for things like laboring for your labor. And then later on somebody says, I need to see Pastor Green. I just lost my job. They just fired me. And I don't know what I'm going to do. What you should have done was been in prayer when we had laboring for your labor. The division of labor protecting you. But you didn't hear that prodding. And neither did you go back uh, to hear uh, the the, the, the iPod uh, of the cast, amen. But Joel says uh, in chapter 2, uh, verse number, around verse 15, what does it say? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Every, uh, first Wednesday, uh, throne room prayer. Sancti call a what? A solemn, solemn assembly. assembly. It's not just a regular general assembly when we have church on Sunday morning, but some of you act like when we call Solomon assembly, like we ain't said nothing, and you end up getting uh, yourself in trouble. But I'm going to keep prodding you. Call the Solomon assembly, sanctify fast, do what? Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Assemble yeah. the elders? Gather the children. We gather 120 deacons and elders on Sunday, and if we have 20 of them on a solemn assembly, I can count them. I understand people got lives to live, but I'm just saying. Notice what it says. Gather the people, the, the elders. Who else? Sanctify the congregation. I'm going to read that a little stronger. Sanctify what that? Sanctify the congregation. Yes. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. and gather those the children. And those that suck the breast. Those that are still are being breastfed. That means mothers that are nursing, even in the cry room. You're supposed to be here. Just because you've had a maternity leave, that don't last forever for you to be out of church for three or four months at a time. Because your children, you better do what Hannah did. You better wean them and give them to the priest and get yourself back in the church of God. Everybody's supposed to be present. Let the bridegroom go forth oh, of his chamber. Church, cause I'm, you know, I'm about to get married, man. I'm looking for tucks. I'm trying to find caterers. I tell you what, that, that marriage is going to be on a, a shaky foundation where you are so more committed to your bridegroom in the natural than you are the bridegroom. Luke Matthew 25 says, uh, when he comes, you didn't have enough oil. When he comes looking for the church, you does not, you do not have enough oil in your lamp. Let the bridegroom do what now? Go forth of his chamber. Come out of the chamber. Get out of the closet. And the bride out of her closet. Tell her to get out of the bridal closet. Let the priests the ministers of the Lord. Let the priests, all these ministers that got ministries all over the place, you can't respond to a solemn assembly in your house. Weep between the porch and the altar. Weep between the porch and the altar. One of the time we did a solemn assembly, I had an intercessor. Nisa, God bless all the intercessors that are working. God bless you for, for doing what you do. But that particular uh, day, I think it was a church event, uh, uh, anniversary, she had all the ministers to come up and weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, 
Spare thy people. Let them say what? What are they going to say? Spare thy people, O oh Lord. Say what? Spare, spare thy people. people. There are times when we call Solomon Assembly that we're saying spare your people. Spare our children at football game. Spare our jobs. Come on, somebody. That's what we say when we have Solomon Assemblies. Amen? And if we don't sometimes respond to those Solomon Assemblies, we end up between a, rock, between a rock and a hard place. Okay, let's keep moving. That's prodigal. That's prodding. We don't want things to turn out badly for you. All right, let's go now into, I think we're ready for the 12 types of vision. 12 types of vision. Welcome to More Than Conquerors Faith Church, uh, the division of labor. We're talking about the division, vision. So we're about to go into vision. We don't want division. Division is D-I hyphen vision, a vision that dies. The division of labor, spiritual boot camp is what we're doing here. Workers and leaders training got my feet shot. Now let's kind of download what I call the 12 types of vision. 12 types of vision. 12 types of vision. Uh, this is a lesson number one. And we'll get ready in a little bit, I guess, to take a break. Let's go into those 12 types of vision. Number one, no vision. No vision. Somebody say, every time you turn around, past Green coming up. With another vision. Well, we in bad shape when there is no vision. Amen. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. If we're not coming up with uh, uh, visions of turkey drives and uh, New Year's party and, and IMF and come on somebody in fellowship bowling night and if we ain't got no vision, then everybody talking about what more than Congo doing? Uh, what does he ever sleep? We're sharks. I told the ministry of shark, right? S H A R K S H hyphen shark, shark, S H hyphen ark. We got the ark of the covenant. We are the ark. Whenever the ark was moving, they were going toward their destiny. If we ever stop moving toward and we're just camping out, that's what we do on Sunday morning. And God gives us direction when we're here and we take the ark and start moving. We're shark. A shark is in the ocean. And if a shark ever stops moving, we call shark tanks. I was telling uh, uh, the uh, leadership elders and deacons one morning that we're calling shark tanks. Now, we're not talking about the kind of tanks in Atlanta with an aquarium where it's confined and restricted. We're talking about a tank. We're talking about a military weapon vehicle that's uh, uh, secured, closed in, and they are hitting targets because they're covered. We're not talking about the infantry that's uh, exposed uh, on the front line in the prone position and in the foxhole. We're talking about tank. Uh, this worship, this house, is a shark tank. You seen the, uh, you know, that professional businessmen where they got all these rich people and they're they're, they're uh, people trying to get their businesses passed and they come before the sharks because they're experienced after forty four years and forty two years of uh, of MTC, uh, thirty nine years of pastoring. Uh, this is not our first rodeo. Uh, we are shark tank. We can look when the minister and tell him if it's time. We can look at a service. We can look at well, come on somebody and, and we'll say I'm out. Uh, no, for what you're trying to do and what you think you're going, I'm out. Uh, we got more confidence in sharks than a professional business panel than we do in a board of ministry. The devil is a liar. You must have hands laid on you. It's a shark tank. Amen to God. So where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So that's what's called, first of all, uh, uh, no vision. Number two. Delayed vision. Delayed vision. Uh, Ezekiel 12. Uh, go look at it yourself. 21, 28, where it says the vision shall no longer be delayed. When we built this beautiful edifice, you can kind of pull out and scan as long as you need to, as wide as you need to. When we built this, getting the whole stage and the whole uh, setting, chairs included. Uh, on this side here when we built this uh, over to my left in his organ now you can come back this way uh, we bought it right around 1990 but the vision was delayed uh, for like eight years and everybody would pass by and say are they ever going to build it was built it was a vision uh, uh, that God gave but it was it was delayed but it was delayed not denied 2,000 years uh, uh, in, in the year 2000 we came marching in a delayed vision uh, but not a denied but sometimes when it's delayed uh, Proverbs says uh, hope deferred not denied hope deferred makes the heart sick uh, because you didn't get it when you thought okay so there's no vision number two there's delayed vision uh, 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 the no vision number one delayed vision number two and then there is the vision the vision not several vision 
Habakkuk chapter 2 says, write the vision. Might not be a place to just go ahead and at least look at that one because it's going to be coming up. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 says, write the vision. My, uh, my trait is this. You know, we have all kind of policies about church, all kind of principles on how we operate, new members training class, announcements are posted on the board. It's always, always written somewhere. It's on the screen during our announcements. But here's what Habakkuk says uh, about visions in chapter 2. What does it say? And the Lord answered me and said, write the write, vision. Write it. Write the vision. And make it plain upon tables. Make it plain upon tables. iPad, tablets, right? Make it plain. Everything we do, every decision that we make, whether it's dealing with funerals or weddings, whether it's dealing with church services or new members, it has already been written. Because when you're facing the enemy and he's trying to destroy you, you must do what Jesus said when Satan tried to tempt him and give him things, a kingdom ahead of time. You know how Jesus said? What did Jesus, what did Jesus say in Matthew 4 and Luke 4? It is written. Get behind me. Write the vision. The vision must be written. For why? The vision. That, the, that he may run that readeth it. That he may run that readeth it. A lot of things. Uh, we heard one of our trustees saying some things one day. He said, if the, uh, if, if the enemy want to hide things from people, he'll put it in the book. First, got to read it. That he that run that readeth it. Keep going for me. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. For an appointed time. Even the time that you have, somebody's got to appoint your time. I have too many people say, oh, it's my time. Well, well, I get that, but who appointed that time for you? Well, God told me. Well, God also gave apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers. And Galatians says, if you understand the Abba, Father concept, you are under tutors and governors until the fixed date appointed of the Father. Little F. It is your Father that appoints your time. Jesus coming back. It's a matter of time, but he don't know when he's coming back because the Father appoints the time. It's not your friends. Uh, come on, so it's not your clique. Uh, it's the Father's that appoints the time. And Galatians says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth uh, his son, born of a woman, and causing Jesus to cry, uh, Abba, Father. Abba, Father is what releases your time. If you don't access your heavenly Father, your spiritual Father, it's not your time or your natural Father. Uh, bride should go to her natural father and say I think it's time for me to get married. Then they go to the spiritual father and he blesses that wedding and then of course the heavenly father. That's how you know when it is your time. Amen. Uh, it's for an appointed time. Okay so there's uh, uh, in this lesson there's number one talking about the types of vision. No vision. Number two. Delayed vision. Number three. The vision. Number four. My vision. My vision. Now, Personal. What's your vision? We were talking about the church vision but let somebody said, well, is it all about the church? No. There are some things that you have a vision that you want God to do, right? He says, uh, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Amen? So Psalm 37, there is a place called my vision. But when it comes to church, uh, uh, the church, that's not your vision. It's not the trustee's vision. Come on, it's not the elders and deacons' vision. It's not the choir vision, whether we're going to dress casually or robe. It, your vision is what kind of furniture you go buy at your house, what kind of car, who you're going to marry. There is a dimension called my vision. Number five. Division. And if split. you understand the difference between your vision and the heavenly vision and the pastor's vision, it would bring us to a place called division. Division, 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 division. How good, how pleasant it is for brethren, Psalm 133, to dwell together in unity. It's like the ointment that flows down from the head. It starts from the head, down to the beard, the presbyteros, the elders, down to the skirts, descends upon the mountains of Zion and Hermon, and it says like the dew, and there the Lord commands the blessing. The commanded blessing, when you understand, the vision starts from the head. Amen. God never in scripture, you see him when he's busting a move, talk to a committee. Nowhere. He called Abraham out. He called Noah out, gave him a vision. Come on. He called Joshua out, gave him promises. Y'all, you're not talking to me. He, uh, uh, he never speaks to committee in the seven churches of Asia to the angel of the church. He doesn't call, he didn't call Joshua and Moses and all the elders up to uh, 40 days in faith. He called uh, the uh, Moses out and says, look, the spirit that I put on you 
you, Moses, uh, in Numbers chapter 11, you must take that spirit and put that spirit on your elders because if they don't have your spirit, your vision is going to die, and that's called die vision. And a house divided cannot stand. Division the there, Matthew 12, 24 through 26 says, a house divided cannot stand. Now, we are going to do some labors of division. Now, Joshua, when he got to the end of fighting from Joshua chapter 16, he took all the tribes and he divided their inheritance. If you'll stay in your place, uh, then there will be a whole lot of blessings coming your way because it flows from the head. So there's division, then a, a type of vision. And then there's revision, revision change. change. This is what the world wants to do. They want to change the order of God. We were building this building and we thought we had all the specs and uh, laid out, but come to find out, uh, every now and then the builders and the architect will come and do a change order. Sometimes God will change the sermon. It may not go the way but the world, Romans 1 says, they are trying to cause revision in the order of God. It used to be uh, Adam and Eve. Okay, but now it's, I won't say Adam and Steve, that's for sure, that's two men. Or oh, it's not woman and woman. You cannot revise the order of God. You cannot say it's the board uh, over the pastor, come by. No, it's the pastor that appoints deacons. We cannot revise it. They change uh, the glory of man uh, uh, over in Romans in that kingdom and to the natural use of men against men and women against women. And it said God would judge them in the recompense of their error. Revision. This is why Romans 12 says it's so important that you take advantage of sound doctrine, Bible studies, and, and not just when we're prophesying. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, that you not be conformed to this world, but don't conform to the spirit of this age. Because this new age thinking, they are revising everything. They are revising uh, marriage the way it looks. They're revising whether or not you come to church and say it don't matter, just go online. No, you cannot revise what God has ordained. Dana. For the Bible clearly says uh, over in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Yes, the assembling of ourselves together uh, as a manner of some is. In most meetings, uh, they don't do viral voting when it comes to things. You have to be present, Congress. You have to be present, city council, board meetings. You have to be present. So the church, when it says not forsake the assembling, the word assembling means a voting body. And not when you vote the pastor out or the choir out. No, it is those when you come together, you begin to vote and legislate all the principalities of darkness and run them out. So your praise is a vote. Your clap is a vote. Your shout is a vote. And when we all come together and not forsake the assembling of ourselves, Hebrews 10, 5, I think we need to spend some time on that revision. Come on, Hebrews 10, 25. When you see a more than conquerors packed out uh, on Easter, packed out on New Year's, uh, packed out on anniversary you see the pictures when we come on and then some Sundays is down because of the rain is down because of people remote uh, that's not the order of God you're not stable come on somebody every Sunday if you miss as many Sundays uh, on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays on your job in school as you miss Sundays your job would not be secure your children would be failing no some of your children got perfect attendance some of you got the award of the year because you don't miss a time you get to work early first one to get there and the last one to leave but if you come dragging and lasting with your feet they're not shod uh, you might be here one Sunday you may not and it's not because you're working it's because you have conformed to this age. So they've revised it. What does Hebrews 10, 25 say? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. The assembly, the assembly of ourselves what? Together. Together. We all come together. What? As, As the, the manner of some is. The manner of some is bad manners. But uh, exhorting. Hold on. Now. As the manner of some is, that word as the manner means to, as the habit uh, of many have become. It's easy to form bad habits. Well, you know, man, there's no one. I feel it coming through my house. I'm drinking my coffee, doing a little brunch, and I ain't got to wait. No, no, you don't choose this. You don't revise the order of God. Uh, we're talking about the 12 vision of God revision. Not uh, forsaking the assembling of as the manner of some is or the habit of many have become. But watch this. But exhorting one another. But exhorting. You come together to exhort. So if you're at home, you ain't got nobody to exhort. Just you. 
That's the problem with just being in person by yourself. Exhorting one another. Oh, brother, you can make it. Yeah, oh, they, uh, yeah we had people had tragedies and deaths, and I won't call their name. But when they come to church, you go and say, man, I'm praying for you. Yeah, you can text them and all that kind of stuff. I get that. Uh, but here, when you come together, exhorting one another, what? And so much the more. And so much the more. As ye see the day approaching. Miss Gregory in Pratt City, when I was first getting saved, she used to have a little outside Bible study. Uh, right there behind First Baptist Church, and she would give us some rub old cookies and, and some Kool Aid, but we couldn't get the, the, uh, the Kool Aid and cookies till we came to our house for study. And I never will forget, as a little bitty boy, she taught me this song The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the happier we'll be. For your friends are my friends, and my friends are your friends. And the more we get together, <laughs> man. So, uh, so much the more. The church should be coming together so much more. We should not be doing less than what we did. Well, I'm just going, man, this thing now, you know, I'm about 65 years old. I'm kind of old and dying. Where's your Caleb anointing? Caleb at 85, the Bible tells us, said, give me this mountain. In Joshua chapter 14, he said, I'm just as strong uh, at 85 that I was 45 years ago when Moses sent me out to the spot. Are you just as strong when more than conquerors first got started? Are you kind of dying off? Okay, that's what I thought. Now let's go back. So we don't we don't want to revise God's plan, but come together so much the more as watch this as we see the day approaching. All right, what other kind of vision we got? Number seven, envision. Envision. Envision to envision to envision to envision. What do you see on the inside? Envision. My bad. The envision. Uh, e n. Uh, Misspell that. Envision. That means to literally to see something on the inside. I mean, what are you seeing? Sometimes God has to open your eyes so your inside starts looking uh, like your, uh, outside, your outside starts looking like what's on the inside. And then number eight, that's what's called a written vision. vision. We've already talked about write the vision, write it down. Number nine, know the vision. Not say queen. Oh, not no, uh, not no vision. No, we don't want to do this. No, we don't want to uh, come to church. No, we don't want to have an impartation of Labor Day. No, no vision. Do you know the vision? Do you know what our mission statement is? That we are a family church, a Bible teaching center, teaching quality word, making quality disciples, producing quality fruit, <laughs> right? Uh, a ministry reaching the world in this city. Do you know our business term, uh, what our core competency is? At business? Do you know our core competency, the core? What's our core value? What's the thing that we're known for? What's our calling card? What's our go-to? You ought to know what it is by now. It's praise and worship. It's praise and worship. That's our core vision. That's our, we're, we're very competent. We're very competitive in that. Amen. Business means you understand that. What's your core competency? As the church is chicken? Uh, it's chicken. You're not catfish. As Jim and Nick's what it is, it's barbecue. Come on, it's not chicken. What's your core competency? You got to know the core of what, uh, uh, and you don't need an uncore, right? Core. Uh, don't be a core because our thing is worship. That's what we're competent in. We can't do nothing else at more than conquer. We can praise it. We can shout. That's, that's what Judah does best. All they do, you go to more than conquerors, all they do, that's almost like saying all a dog does is bark and all a duck does is a quack. And a cat don't do nothing but meow. He still meow. And they still, well, what's your, what's your core? At least we're still doing the same thing we've been doing, but yet we're progressing. We're doing the same thing, but it's not at the same level. We're going from glory to glory to glory to glory, and the glory of this latter house is greater than that of the former. That's the core of what it is. The core of heaven is not an occupation. It's not a factory. If you go to heaven, it's all about worship. We're trying to get you where, well, worship is too long. Well, I don't think you plan on going to heaven. There's some, been some people that are transferred there. Well, the core of heaven uh, is, is not school. It's not education. It's not buying houses. It's not uh, vacation. The core competency of heaven is worship. Angels cease not to fly. One crying holy, another crying holy. That's what we're trying to prepare you for your next destination. And all the people said, amen. A written vision. I right? know the vision, right? All right. Number 10, supervision. Supervision. Bishop. Oh, yes, yes, a bishop, a bishop. I know we were saying no division, and I cut y'all, we were about to say acquainted. But supervision, that's what we don't like. We don't like supervisors, a lot of us. 
We don't like supervisors on the job. We don't like supervision. What is supervision? It's just that. It's somebody that's got supervision. You got vision, but somebody got supervision. Most of the supervisors have been at that company for a while, and they should be able to see what you cannot see. They'll come help you out of things, right? In the kingdom of supervision, it's called a bishop. It's an overseer. Somebody to look over what you're about to do, over your business, over your plans, to look over your ministry. Supervision. Amen? So we need supervision. These are the 12 types of vision. Sometimes we don't want nobody. It's my thing. Pastor Green, he can do more than conquer, but when it comes to my ministry, I don't need him watching over the Lord it gave it to me. Oh, is that right? Uh, okay. Tell your supervisor that on your job. Go, go to McDonald's and tell them that. Talk about, I don't want to do uh, Big Macs anymore. I want to do it the way Burger King do it. No. Your supervisor will say, did you forget what we trained you? This is how we do it in this house? Okay. Supervision is needed. They'll call bishops. They'll call apostles. Amen? And then there's blurred vision. Blurred. Plain, clear. Yeah. When, when the vision is blurred, you cannot see. Second Peter says, make your calling and election sure. And if you do these things, adding brotherly kindness and adding virtue and knowledge, it said these things make you so that in Second Peter 1, so that you'll neither barren nor unfruitful, but unfruitful in the things of God. Second Peter 1, read it. It said, but if you lack these things, if you lack them, then it says your, version, your vision become blurred and you, are, you can only see those things that are close to you, but you cannot see those things that are far off. Many of the things that a bishop or a pastor is asking you to do has nothing to do with right now. But if you can trust it and not let your vision, myopia, get in there, it will not be blurred. Amen. And then number 12. Number 12, provision, provision supplied. That's what we want more than anything else. One of the words of the Lord to us as a church was that God was giving us provision. He will provide. That name is Jehovah Jireh. For 42 years, I've been watching God provide. The finances go up, they go down. People come, they go. The interest rates in the natural kingdom go up and they go down. But you know what? Our God shall provide. When you obey what God says, it may look like it's about to die. That what was about to happen with uh, we see with Abraham, uh, with Isaac. He looked like death was inevitable. He had the boy all tied up. But by the time he got to the top of that mountain in Genesis 22, God already had a ram caught up in the bush. And that is known as Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Everything that God tells you to do, it may look like it's a bad move, but if he really, really said it according to the principles of God. Now, everything lining up, if it's principle, not just a, a dream, a, 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 not just an unction, not just a prophecy, but if it lines up with the dream and the prophecy and the word of God, I promise you there's a ram caught up in the bush, which means the Lord our God, he will supply. Those are the 12 uh, types of vision. So thank God for that. Amen. All right. Uh, let's... Um, I think we want to do one more lesson. Do we have time to do, uh, take a shake, uh, a break right now? Do we have time? Okay, no answers. So I'll keep going. Let's do the attitude of a conqueror. The attitude of a conqueror. Real quickly, let's go into what I call the attitude of a conqueror. Amen. If we're going to be a conqueror, then we must have our attitudes together. Are we prepared now of the attitude of a conqueror? Uh, this is obviously uh, going to be in two parts where Jesus himself is an example of an attitude of a conqueror. Now, where do we find that? In Philippians chapter 5, uh, that said, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation. He didn't care about what people think, right? Let this mind, the word mind in Philippians 2, we want to read that? Yes, sir. Okay, Philippians 2 5 says, so Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. This mind, this mindset, this, ad, this word mind means an attitude. Yes, if you read for me. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no, no reputation. reputation. This is the attitude of a conqueror. And took upon him the form of a servant. Now he took upon him the form of a servant. Of a servant. The form of a servant. He wouldn't have the title servitude that's the attitude the form of a what now of a servant and the next lesson we're going to be dealing with is how do you serve 
He took upon the form of a what? Servant. He's God, but he laid down his, de his deity to take upon humanity because he came not to be ministered to, but to minister to or to serve. He took upon the form of a servant, which means well, I need to build a pulpit or I need to handle the book bags. Whatever you need me to do, I'm going to serve. I don't just serve communion with a black suit on. I serve in respect rallies. I, I serve in the gym. How do we serve? He took upon the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. Made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man. The fashion he wrote, his fashion was this. It wasn't his light ladies, ladies outfit because he'd been shopping uh, at Saks Fifth Avenue. Come on, somebody. Uh, Azars, come on. His fashion was. As a man. He was just a man. He was a man. His, his latest fashion was, I'm all man. I'm not just God. I'm a man. I weep. I cry. I hunger. I get anger. The fashion that he'll wear, it's, it is fashionable to be a man. The son of God and the son of man. He humbled himself. Humility. Right? He's fashion. He humble. He's humble. Proverbs 22 says, before there is honor, there must be humility. He humbled himself to his own creation. He humbled himself to his own creation. So sometimes there are people in leadership saying, well, man, I used to do that. I can't do that no more. Yeah, just because you're the bishop and the apostle and the preacher and the minister don't mean you can't serve communion. Don't mean you can't make a hospital visit. I mean, as an elder, have you ever gone to see anybody? Do you, do you have frequent visits? Can we put you on the list as a deacon, as a minister of music, a singer? Only time you sing is for gigs? Can you sing at nursing home? Can you sing in jail ministries? It's more to it than just the limelight in the pulpit. Somebody said, well, probably I heard some ministers one time left because Pastor Green don't let nobody preach. Well, man, the prisoners are waiting on you. <laughs> Jesus says uh, he separated Matthew 25, the goats from the sheep. Because of three things, he says, I was hungry, and you did not feed me. I was naked, you did not clothe me. I was sick, you did not visit me. I was in jail, so forth. So those are the ministries that people are waiting. They're, saying, oh, they're waiting to hear your song. I don't, they don't care what key you in. It's only when we get up here, oh, man, worship was so bad. We go, oh, they, it ain't what it used to be. Well, I tell you what, you take some of those same singers and go put them and let them sing to prisoners, and I guarantee they'll love you. Because we're after an agenda that God is not after. But sometimes the people that got the talents and the skills only want to use those skills on the stage. But you can, you can pay them to do anything outside of a, 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 a stellar thing or, or outside of a concert. Ain't nobody impressed with that. I want to know when the last time you went with somebody. That, see, pure religion is this, James says. Pure religion, chapter 2, around verse 27. Here's pure religion. Remember the song, Do You Have Good Religion? Certainly, Lord, do you have good religion? Certainly, Lord, do you have good religion? Certainly, Lord. Certainly, 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 Lord. That's over in James chapter 2. Pure religion, right around verse 27, if I give you time to find that. Pure religion and undefiled is this. To visit the orphans. There's nobody, there's people that can't do nothing for you. And to visit uh, the widows. And if we don't find that, I'll be all right with that. Because we're in Philippians chapter 2. We're just saying that in this next realm, if you really want to impress people and see church grow, start going to vi visit some people nursing home and their daughters and sons come down and ask you what church you go for. We don't have enough uh, ministers of that. So we're now recruiting those of you that's a minister training class, those of you to start going and to visit some nursing home and going to visit some jail cells and, and do some homeless ministry. And you can still come in here and be fed. Did we happen to find that, by the way? Over in James chapter 2. If not, we'll just keep going. It's at the end of James chapter 2 where it says a pure a religion and undefiled this is to visit the widows in their affliction. But I assure you it's there. So let's stay the course. I don't want to get going down too many tracks here. But trust me, it's over there. Let's go back to Philippians 2. I think we do find that, okay? Philippians chapter 2 talks about uh, uh, Jesus humbled himself. Humility is what we're after. Can we continue to read in Philippians chapter Yes, sir. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him from him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He became obedient even unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has have highly exalted him. Have highly exalted him and has given him. A name, name, which is above every name. This is how you get a name. You don't get a name by your talent. You get a name by your humility. You get a name by your obedience. You get a name not by your reputation. You give a name because you admit you're a man. 
If you'll do those aforementioned things, God will give you a name that is above every name. Every name. That at, at the, the name, name of Jesus, Jesus every knee should every bow. Knee should bow of things of heaven things in heaven, heaven and things in the earth things in the earth and things under, under the, the earth. earth those are three realms your name has power not just in the financial world oh you're a big broker everybody respect you in your business world but what about in that demonic world that title that you now have does it cover just corporate or when the demo those demons come in your house do demons flee that's the name we get, and we get them by those four steps. Amen. To God be the glory there. So we're talking about provision. The Lord God will provide. Amen. So we're talking about the Beatitudes. Uh, Jesus is the example of how you increase. I'm getting ready to take a little short break here. Let's go back to, we're talking about right now, uh, the attitude of a conqueror. B, let's talk about the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes or how you should be in your attitude. Get it? How you should be in your attitude. Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, we will uh, just real quickly read them. I mean, this is a serious thing here. Matthew 5, it says, when he was set, he called his disciples to him. His climbing companions is what the message Bible said. When he was set, he sent the multitudes away. One of the attitudes uh, you need to you ask yourself, what if the multitudes that used to gather are not here? They've been sent away. He sent them away. Can we pick that up and we'll just go through them real quickly what each one of these means. Uh, these are the Beatitudes. Uh, Matthew 5, 1 through 8. And you'll find out when you get to the end of it what these attitudes will do for you. It will, in 5, 13, it will make you the salt of the earth. It will make you, in verse 15 through 16, the light of the world. These attitudes salt the earth. It makes you season. If you get these attitudes, you will begin the salt of the earth. You'll become the salt of the earth, but you'll begin to end up being the light of the world. Salt and light is what Jesus calls. Let's just kind of read that uh, just because we can. Matthew 5, 1. Let's just pick it up from the beginning. And seeing the multitudes. And seeing the multitudes. He went up into a mountain. And when he was set. When he was set. His disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, He was said, He sent the multitudes away, all right? And, he, and the disciples came to him and to a mountain. He left the multitudes there because Jesus is not impressed with multitudes because he knew at the end of his life when he came to his purpose, wasn't nobody going to be there but his mama and John. His disciples came to him. Disciples always come up. The reason you can't come up to a higher place is you might be just a part of the multitude and you're not a disciple. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What does it say? And he opened up his mouth and taught them, saying. He taught his disciples. This wasn't a sermon on the mount to the multitudes. This wasn't this big gig, and everybody seemed impacted out. Oh, that's what you measure? Oh, I did my ministry in a place. I had to do three and four services, three or four. Oh, that's what you impressed with? Okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Where do you go? Now, these are the attitude. Number one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of That's heaven. The kingdom, poor in spirit. That means you're bankrupt in spirit, which means I don't have nothing. If God don't give me the Holy Spirit, I am spiritually bankrupt. My storage is empty. I don't know nothing. I've not apprehended. But the moment you think you got it and you can rebuke everybody else, you have the wrong attitude. The only poverty that's allowed in the kingdom is poor in spirit. Bankrupt. I have nothing left. Everything that I am is because of you. What else did he say? Number, Number two. two blessed are they that mourn. Oh. For they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. Somebody said, well, you know, we uh, had some mourning going on. A couple of uh, deaths that more than conquerors. We, it must be a curse somewhere. Well, must, wait a minute. Are you reading what I'm reading, disciples? You are blessed when you mourn. Why? Because now you're really about to find out if you have a comforter or you just have a religious spirit shouting. Because if the comforter does not comfort you when the funeral is over, you do not have the attitude of a conqueror. So sometimes God will allow mourning to come in, but he turns your mourning into dancing and the Holy Spirit comforts you when nobody else can comfort you. Number three, the third attitude. Blessed are the meek, the for meek. they shall inherit the earth. They inherit the earth. The meek. Receiving the engrafted word with meekness. Meekness means teachable. 
Amen. Your inheritance is tied into your meekness. I know it's scatologically. Uh, we're going to uh, the earth is the Lord's and we're going to inherit the earth. But I'm talking about that piece of earth and that lot that God has given you. You must be meek. Meekness is tied to your inheritance. All right. That's an attitude. Number four, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after oh, righteousness. It's an attitude. Why? For they shall be filled. They shall be filled. Somebody said, well, you know, I went to church and, uh, you know, it didn't, the church didn't do that. Well, you ain't been eating all week. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Are you still hungry for God? I'm hungry for you. We used to sing, I'm hungry for you. I need your touch. I need your power. I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. I'm thirsty for you. I need a fresh touch. I need your power. I'm thirsty for you. Blessed are they that hunger. This is the attitude. Are you hungry? Can't you wait? Someone said, man, I can't wait to get home. I can't wait the 4th of July. I can't wait to go out on Friday night dinner for that steak. Are you still hungry for the word? Do you esteem the word of God more than your necessary food? Are you still hungry? Or are you so filled with your own prosperity and resume that there's nothing else to be fed? Hunger, that's the attitude that we serve. Blessed are they that hunger. Number five, these attitudes. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. Oh, don't, don't even go there. The attitude of a conqueror. Bless are the merciful. You, I'm reminded of this story of this. You know it over in Matthew chapter 18 of this man that owed like $10 million worth of debt. And, uh, you know, his debt was all wiped away. And he had a servant that came to him. The Bible says owed him about $20. That's in modern day terminology. He owed, uh, the servant only owed him $20. God wiped out a $10 million debt, and he took the servant by the throat and began to choke him over $20. Somebody said, well, I can't relate to that finance because I ain't never had $10 million. Well, your spiritual debt was worth more than that. God canceled all the sins of your past, present, and future that you could never pay God back. But you see somebody in church do one thing. I'm going to be talking about the sin issue in a little bit. And you choke them, you, I mean, you act like, I mean, just the whole sky is falling because you've lost your mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endure forever. You see it in Psalm 107. You see it in Jehoshaphat. They sung one line, for the Lord is good, and his mercy endure. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace, Hebrews 4, 16, that we may obtain mercy. Mike Murdoch one time wrote a book said, Mercy rewrote my life. Amen. Thank God for the mercy of God. It is of the Lord, Lamentation 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen. All right, who else? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I have people saying, oh, I just don't see God in this, all this stuff. You know, I can't see God. Maybe the reason you can't see God in what we're doing because your heart is so messed up. Only the pure in heart can see what God is doing. If your heart is messed up, it will blur your vision of where God is. I'm telling you, if your heart is full of the cholesterol of unforgiveness and mercy, uh, I promise you, God will be doing, I just can't see why we, I don't see why we got to have a, a screen. I, I can't see why we got to go to St. John. I, I can't see why we got to do all this uh, New Year's. I, I can't, yeah, why don't you check your heart? You won't be able to see what God is doing. Amen. Nicodemus, a ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus and says, uh, uh, Master, uh, you know, uh, he's a ruler and he came by night. And Jesus says, unless a man be born of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you know we're in bad shape when we got rulers, elders, deacons, and trustees. They know the law. They've been in church. But they need a rebirth. They don't see the kingdom of God unless you get born again over and over and over in the spirit being he's begotten us again Peter says to a lively hope you will not see what God is doing I promise you that you have to keep your heart pure amen to the pure all things are pure the next quality number seven blessed are the peacemakers, peacemakers. for peacemakers. they shall be called the children of God okay how are they gonna know we're children of God because of our choir because of our aesthetics our building our landscape our bumper stickers now, the peacemakers, 
Do you initiate the peace? Jesus came from heaven there. He made the first move. If you know your brother had all, you know somebody got off against you in one of your departments, you know it's an issue. Here's the rules of engagement. You are to leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled. You make the first move. God made the first move. Well, you know, they, they did to me. I ain't saying I'm sorry. Uh-uh. God didn't wait on you to make a move. He made the first move. The only ministry that exists in, 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 in church for real is the ministry of reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace breakers starting stuff. The peacemakers shall be called the children of God. Attitudes of a conqueror. Next, blessed are they that which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Keep going. Next, blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Okay, revile you. So watch this. So first, when men shall, uh, when men shall persecute you, not prosecute you, persecute. You're persecuted but not forsaken. Right? Blessed are the, when, what does it say? Blessed are they that are persecuted? Yes, sir. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They get all of heaven. When people persecute you for righteousness sake, all, you're, you're living under an open heaven because of persecution. Now, when they go another step, when they revile you, right? Blessed are you when, and say all manner of things against you, what? Falsely, we're yes. keep reading for me. Yes, sir. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute, persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. When they say all manner of evil against you falsely. Yes. For my sake. Then he says, rejoice. You're supposed to rejoice. Well, pastor, you just don't know what they're saying. If it's a lie, I'm just going to take my praise up to another level. Rejoice and be what? Exceedingly glad. Exceedingly glad. For, for great, great is your reward in heaven. So if you want to see your reward go to another level, let God activate your accusers and prosecutors, and they are paying for your next award. I want to sometimes send all my enemies a letter of thanks, saying thank you for talking about me, lying on me, abandoning me, because it means God just takes you to a whole nother level. These are the attitudes of a conqueror. We get ready to land this thing here. And if you do those things, you'll see in verse number 13, this is what it leads to. What's the result of the attitude of a conqueror? Number 13. Ye are the salt of the he earth. becomes the salt of the earth. That's what they lead to. And? But if the salt have lost its savor. If you lost your savor. Where? Savor. Your seasonness. Your incense. Your worship. If the salt has lost its savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? How is the earth going to get salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. It's good for nothing. But to be cast out. And to the trotter, trodden under the feet of men. It will be cast out and trodden under the feet. So what the enemy wants to do is just walk all over you. If you ever lose your attitudes, you will be trodden and you will be good for nothing. Or I like to say it, you good, but you good for nothing. You good at it, but God made you good for nothing. It's all in vain. You are not going to be good for nothing. I'm not good at preaching and praying and prophesying for nothing. All these goods is for something. It's to heal the brokenhearted. I know the word. I'm good at it. I mean, I give God praise. I'm good for something. Somebody's like, well, you know, that child, he ain't going to be good for that. No, I'm good for something, and you are good for something. And that's something that you're good at in church and on your job. You ought to keep bringing the goods. Amen? You become the salt of the earth, and it goes on to say what else? Ye are the light of the world. Salt of the earth. That means you're right into the system. You're salt of the earth, but you're the light of the world system. Salt and light. So we're going to say, let your light so shine before men that they may see. So the next page you'll see on that, the results, the results, the results, the results. If you turn page on lesson number two, you'll see the results on the point number C. Uh, the results are. Uh, uh, number, number one. One. Salt. We just read that. Matthew 5, 13. Number two. Light. light. Matthew 5, 14. Right? And number three. Good works. Good works. Good works. Good works. Somebody say every time you turn around, more than Congress doing something, man. They're doing a benefit concert. They're, they're, they're doing something with the mom's tour. Uh, yeah, this salt and light is for what? For good works. I believe that even on your job, you're going to have some good work. Good contract. People ain't going to just be giving you any kind of thing to do, but your life will end up in good works. Amen? So these are the kind of things we're doing. I'm going to Get ready now to just take a break, and we'll see how far we go. We'll come back with a couple of lessons. 
Uh, we won't be much longer. Uh, we'll just take it. It won't be a break for you. We'll go right until we go into lesson three that talks about how to serve. Well, praise the Lord again, everybody. This just took a little short uh, regrouping there. You didn't notice it much, but uh, we're a, a part of, uh, we're in, well into now, uh, boot camp 2024, more than conquerors version of workers training for all the things that we do. We got to know what we're doing. Daniel 11.32 says, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Amen. So we've already had the introduction. We've already talked about what boot camp is all about, war, all that kind of thing. And our theme we want to reinforce is got my feet shot. I'm planted in the house of God. Those that are planted, Psalm 92 said, in the house of God, they're not wavering. They are the ones, right, that shall flourish they got the flower, F-L-O-U-R. They don't need the F-L-O-W-R. They don't need flowers. They don't need a pat on the back. They just do what they do because they know serving the Lord will pay off. Hey, I was uh, kind of wrestling with that uh, scripture over in James. I was just one chapter off. I kept saying uh, James 1, uh, 227, pure religion. It was James 1, 27, pure religion and undefiled this. It's taking care of the orphans. Those are the babes that can't take themselves. And the widows, those that need uh, ministering too. We even got ministry for what's called the widow's ministry. I'm excited about this whole arm of God that helps us to know that what we're wrestling against, not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. Uh, so we're to take unto us the whole arm of God. And the most important part of that armor is the shield of faith more than conquerors. We are a family church. We are a Bible teaching center more than conquerors. Faith church. He's our shield. Amen. Over in Psalm 91, it says, I will say of the Lord, he's my fortress. His truth shall be my buckler and my shield. His faithfulness is what the shield. Just because God has told you the truth, that the shield of God and the truth of God, uh, uh, that uh, equates to what we call the shield of God. Now, aren't you thanking God that he's saying to you what he said to Abraham in Genesis 4, uh, 15? He was writing a vision too. After Abraham tithed in Genesis 14, chapter 15, the Lord appeared to him in a vision. You'll be surprised visions you get 12 types after you get the tithe thing right. Read Genesis 14, chapter 15, he would say, and the Lord appeared to him in a vision and it says, I am your shield, and I am your reward. I am your great reward. I am your abundant compensation. Amen. So because time is moving on, and many of you are catching this in the evening time uh, in school, I want to do just a couple of more lessons. We'll get through them as fast as we possibly can. This lesson number three is called How to Serve. How to Serve. Amen. Boy, if we need, uh, because we're back in service, that's the whole uh, theme of this boot camp uh, is we're back in service again. Somebody said, man, we back in church again. Man, we on Wednesday night. We on uh, ministers training class. We on, you know, um, uh, impartations to the my father's bit. We're back in service again. As some of the people that's been in military that said they were going to retire after four years, then they re uh, uh, enlisted again. Then after uh, eight years, they re -listed. They were back in the service again, and they found it very hard to retire we are back in service. I know. Do you feel the same way uh, I, I feel or felt during COVID? When, I mean, we were, everything was just remote, kind of like what we were doing. And when nobody in the sanctuary, I'm having to do those like I'm doing now. But boy, when the saints came back to worship, those that did, somebody was, you know, everybody ain't coming back. Well, that ain't nothing new. Come on, you read the whole Bible, right? This is why we're doing sound doctrine on Tuesday nights. Bible study, midweek service on Wednesday night is to teach you how God operates. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in introducing this, how to serve. You know, according to the book of Ezra, chapter 2, that after they had been taken into ba the Babylonian captivity, when they came back, they got in Babylon, and Psalm 137 says, uh, you know, when we were carried away into Babylon, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. While they were over in that, or like I call the COVID season, they say, how, they say, how can we sing Zion's song in a strange land? That was some strange land for us, man, <laughs> of not being able to gather together and not be able to go to school and shopping and that doing COVID. 
So during that time, man, uh, many of us found ourselves not getting back to the house of God. Well, once God released them, just as he said in Jeremiah chapter 29, he said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. and They are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. That they would be in that captivity, Jeremiah 29 says, for 70 years. Once that 70 years expired, all those that went into captivity, they got comfortable over there. And a lot of them never made it back. That's what churches are seeing all over America. Once we went into that COVID captivity, people still are online. They still have fears and they have not made it back. On any given Sunday, as we're doing our services, sometimes it may be a good first Sunday crowd. Others, but our, our numbers online, they're always there. It may be upward from anywhere, 800, 900, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000, sometimes 3,200 hits more than what we could get in the sanctuary so people get comfortable, uh, you know, in Zion. That's why the little prophet Amos says, woe unto them in chapter 9 of Amos that are at ease in Zion. Don't get too at ease, too relaxed. Attend, hut, right? All your attention. We'll talk about that with the Queen of Sheba. When she came to see what was happening on in Solomon's temple at his church, she paid a visit in 1 Kings 10, and she noticed several things. We won't go into all of them right now. She noticed the attendance of the minister. She noticed the apparel which they were wearing. She noticed the ascent of how they went up into the glory. Not only how they went up the corporate ladder, but how they went up to the ascent of the Lord. How they went from glory to glory to glory. Now, if you're doing an Atlanta flight from Birmingham, you don't really have to fly that high because you're going to get there that quick. But if you're going to Africa, you're probably going to fly a whole lot higher. It depends on how high you're trying to go. So those that came back, the Bible says, when they came back in, in Ezra, when the, that, that remnant came back, then it says, many of them sought to find their their names in the, the register. I mean, like, and I hate to be putting you on the spot like that. Thank you, Charmaine, for working with me so much. But over in that little book of Ezra, if we don't find it, I think it's like around chapter 2 of Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther and Ezra right there together. Chapter 2, even though I got all these notes, it's obvious. I also want to keep the prophetic word. It says that remnant that came back, they came to make sure their name was still on the road. They were still good, but they could not find their name in the genealogy until they find uh, found a priest. It's around 260, 61, 262, 263, 264. It says they sought to find their name in the yes. register. What does it say there? Verse 62. That's what? These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, mm -hmm. but they were not found. They couldn't find their records. Somehow, when Nebuchadnezzar came, they didn't have the records anymore, but they couldn't find them. Genealogy is very important to restoration. What church? Some people, I mean, oh, man, now that I'm out of more than conquer, me and my wife decided we're doing COVID. We just go and still another church. I saw that happen. Oh, really? So you got the right to change your birth records in the, in the courthouse? Really, dude? Really? You're going to change your spiritual genealogy, the house that birthed you, and end and up in somebody else's house and think you're going to stay blessed? Let's keep reading. They sought to find what now? Their genealogy. Their these sought their register. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted, mm -hmm. put from the priesthood? So they just put them. Uh, said they can find their record. They said, "Look, if your name, if you're not a part of this tribe, you can no longer be in the priesthood." Look at me, brothers, especially priests. If you are not in the genealogy of that tribe, you are supposed to be uh, expanded and expunged from the priesthood. They were, uh, they were literally put out of the priesthood. This is strong stuff. We don't get this enough, but we're training you how ministry works. You can't just be in one church and hop up and not be planted. We call it got my feet shot. Everybody, you read this in Numbers, that was a part of the tribe of Judah, remain a part of the tribe of Judah. Everybody that was a part of Asher, remain a part of Asher. Come on. You can't just up and change your birth records. Come on, let's keep going. And the, and the governor, or the All of that. Tirshata, yeah. said unto them yes. that they should not eat of the most holy things. They can't even eat of the most holy thing because they couldn't find the genealogy. Boy, that's crazy. There's a, maybe a lot of big words in there. We'll go over that if we do. We should jump down into the next verse if we do. All right. Here. Till there stood up a priest. Okay, this has happened. There stood, there stood up a priest. With, the, 
with the human in the thumen. With the urim in the thumen, with the urim in the thumen, it's called perfections in light. He wrote, that was the breastplate. He says, we don't have the written record, to, but you are written in our hearts. And God began to give him prophetic revelations from the breastplate of righteousness as to who was a part of that particular tribe. Amen. So that's why we need the presence of God so strong. That's why we need to be on the prophetic things when when you are getting ready to go for the desires of your heart and, and the, you know, the you check uh, the TransUnion and Unifax and whatever it is and the Experian and they, they got the records of how you uh, didn't pay your bills. But then a priest with a Urim and a Thummim says, I know you messed up, but God is getting ready to give you lands that you, d wells you did not dig and vineyards that you did not plant. For out of the revelation of God, you go into what God has. So genealogy and being in a, per a place after your captivity prepares you to eat of what you did not eat of. And I could just go on and on ad nauseum on that. I'll just leave that alone. Amen. So let's talk about now uh, key scriptures on how to serve. How to serve. You'll see them there. There's several. Joshua 24 all the way through verse 15 actually. 24, 15 is what you really want to hone in on. But you can read all of Joshua 24. And it would go on to say, if it seems evil to serve God, to serve God, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Now mind you, I know that's a theme scripture in 20 what? 24. So we're reading of the first scripture, Joshua what? 24. Now, all the uh, former aforementioned scriptures from chapter 16 all the way to 24, he operated in what we call the division of labor. He had divided to every tribe their inheritance. And if that seems evil, the tribe that God calls you to be born in, see, here's the thing. You know, I, I will say this. God says in Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you pastors after my own heart. Do you know that God really don't care if you like that pastor or not? Any more than he care if you like your parent or not. He chose the womb. There are certain things you cannot choose. That's not your choice. That's your parents. That's your sexuality. And it is certainly you cannot choose your pastor. I will give you pastors after mine own heart. And they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Somebody need to tell us that you don't have the right to just uproot and when you've been stable for 15 and 20 years, it's almost like you're saying, I've been part of the John Doe family, you know what I'm saying, the Jane Doe family, and all of a sudden, I'm not a Green now, I'm going to become a Williams, I'm going to become a whatever. No, 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 I'm going to become a Thompson. No, 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 you will be a Green all your life, you will be a Thompson all your life, more than conquerors. Once God plants you there, that's your home all your life. Amen. So we need to understand this thing. He says, so if it seemed evil, the place that God chose for you, then you choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, not just my house or wherever you live in Ross Bridge or North Birmingham or Walker County. No, when God speaks of houses, you know, he ain't just talking about uh, wood and he's not talking about structure. He's talking about genealogy. Remember over in 2 Samuel 9, when David came to the throne, he asked the question, is there anybody left? In the house of Saul. No, he wasn't talking about the family house. He was talking about the lineage. They said, yeah, there's somebody left in that lineage. And his name is Mephibosheth, right? Which means an horrible thing, a despicable thing. He's laying at the feet. Somebody dropped him. Here's what David said in 2 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 4. After Mephibosheth was dropped, he, David says, because of Jonathan's sake, Go get Mephibosheth because he's in the wrong house and tell him to come and he will eat bread at my table continually. Amen. So we must be in the right house. I'm telling you, it's so important that you understand how uh, important that you be in the right house. You know, we see that with David. And well, I don't want to get into this thing here. But when David was bringing the ark back, remember that on 2 Samuel, right around chapter 6, he's returning uh, in recovering the Ark of the Covenant from the house of the Philistines. And he's got that thing. He's bringing it in. He's dancing. He's skipping all the way back. And all of a sudden, uh, the ox fell. And Uzza, Uzza, U-Z-Z-A-H, saw it falling. And all he was trying to do was just help. See, you, please, please listen to me. You know, you can, you can die and lose your life helping the wrong person. 
I'm going to say that again. You can die and lose your life helping the wrong person. That's what Uzzah did over in 2 Samuel, right? Chapter 6. He was just trying to help and keep the thing uplifted. And the Bible says God struck him dead there. Old Testament, mind you, it's Old Testament. But we do see a few deaths in the New Testament too. Ananias and Sapphira. So don't play me crazy now, all right? Well, that was just Old Testament preacher. So in this, all he was doing is trying to just straighten it up. But God did not appoint him to be the helper there. God kills him. David gets an attitude. David is a conqueror. David is a warrior, but he gets mad at God, and he goes no further. He says, I'm stop. I ain't singing. I ain't preaching. I'm praying because I don't like the last move God made. Have you ever seen people uh, get mad because God made a move? We see it right here more than conquerors. We move some people around. People move out. People move in, and people get mad, and they stop right there. They don't usher no more. They don't preach no more. They don't sing because they, what they did was, here's, here's, here's a danger Talking about how to serve. Well, it's going a different way. It's prophetic on the second half. Can we uh, find that? I don't know if it's possible. I may be quoting the wrong thing out of 2 uh, Samuel 6 where he was around verse, I uh, don't know, uh, 7, 13. If not, don't worry about it. I keep quoting it where he was bringing the ark. Just Google yes. Uzzah. Yes, sir. Well, you found that? Verse 6. What does it say there? And it says, and when they came to nation threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the yes, ark sir. of God. Okay, he put forth his hand and he was going to touch the ark. They was bringing it back and uh, we're talking about serving now, right? He was just trying to serve. What happened? And took hold of it. He just took hold of the ark of God. For the oxen shook it. The oxen shook it. The oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against us. Wait Uzzah. a minute. He, God got angry because Uzzah should not be uh, uh, touching that ark. And God smote him there for his error. And there he died wow. by the ark of God. Mm. And so what happened from there? And David was displeased. David got displeased. You know, sometimes God will make a move in your life, move a job, move people out, and you get mad. And David got angry. Keep going. Because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah Perez, to this day. A breakthrough of Uzzah. Where Perez, uh, Perez means the breaker. God broke, God broke in on Uzzah like that. You don't smoke my boy like that. David said, oh, it ain't going down like that. What happens? And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. So David said, I'm stopping right there. What I used to do, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not tithing anymore. I'm not, look, I don't write no more checks more than conquerors anymore because I don't like what they're doing. I'm not ushering anymore. I'm not doing children's church anymore. I'm not in the choir anymore. That's what happens. And you're setting yourself up. And what goes on the same. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom. Oh, so what happened? So what he decided is, I'm just going to take my ark, and I'm not going to use it in my house. I'm going to put my help in somebody else's house. Yes. That's what he did, right? He took yes. the ark and put it in Obed-Edom's house. Yes. But here's the thing. The, the Obed-Edom's house got blessed because your ark, you can put it in the right house, in somebody else's house, and their house get blessed. It just don't bless you. It don't bless you. Keep going. That house, that, that, that ark was in that house for how long? And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. Three months that ark was there. And so David realized, now wait a minute, that ark is really not supposed to be over there. The only reason it's over in that house is because I'm mad at God. I'm mad at the pastor. I'm mad at, the reason I went to work for another, have this, Many of you have done that. You work for companies, and they let you go, and you went and started your own business, and you came back, and you realized you should not have been that, so you, you end up like a prodigal where you were supposed to be. This is what David did. And when he said, wait a minute, I am going to get that ark out of that house and bring it back. And once he did it, the rest was history. He went to dancing and skipping, rejoicing. And at the end of the chapter, it said his wife uh, near the end looked at him so, saying, wait a minute, how gloriously shameful and vile were you today? Because if you ever get your ark in the right place, your body in the right place, married to the right person, working for the right corporation, living in the right city, it's going to be a dance like you never seen before. And those that don't like what you're doing because of what came back to you, they end up, it says that, uh, right down there, Michael, do you see that where it says that she became bare and had no children from that point? It may be near Yes, verse 16. What does it say? And it says, and as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael Saul's daughter looked through a window and and saw King David leaping and dancing she before saw, the Lord. She saw David leaping and 
dancing and shouting and doing all that. And what was the rest of the result? And she displeased him in her heart. And she they despised. No, no. She despised him in her heart. No, the word, her that's all right. I know it's a little dark over there. She did what? She despised. She started hating the move of God. There are some people actually hate the move that God makes. She despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. He blessed them. David, I'm blessing everybody. I got the presence back. Blessings come out of the ark being in the right place. He blessed the people of God. And he dwelt among all the, all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake, a bread. Everybody got blessed. The division of labor. That's the vision. That's the vision of labor. He, he, he peeled off a little bit for everybody. Once you get in the right place, he started dividing the blessings to all the people. I want to say before tomorrow night that this is a time where God is dividing the people that's in the right house. There are many that are viewing that are no longer in the house, but when you make it back to the house of God, there will be a blessing like you have never seen before. I don't know back in there where it says that she had no child and she became barren. I don't know the verse down in there. Me. May be near the end there. I don't Verse 23. Know what it says. Therefore, Micah and, and daughter of Saul had no child until the day of her death. She had no child. She could not produce. Because when you laugh at the man of God, at the move of God, it causes barrenness in your productivity. I promise you, you'll go no further. But anyway, however we got there, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Key scriptures on how to serve. Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise. So it don't mean once you get back in the right house then you come here like you just mad you know like the little boy that the mama said sit down he says yeah I may be sitting down on the outside but I'm standing up on the inside so you see people sometimes God make them come back to a place they don't want to be and you can tell they want to be there yeah that's what we're talking about now you're going to make if you're going to be in the house of God on that job of God back in that marriage again or whatever or whatever's going to be in that city again oh here I am I used to be in California now they got me back in Birmingham now you're going to make a joyful noise all ye lands no matter where you at you're going to serve the Lord with gladness if they transferred you and took you from the top floor down to the bottom floor come on if they took your title wherever you are you are to serve we're talking about how to serve serve the Lord with gladness come in with the presence with singing know ye that the Lord he is God is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Uh, we are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We are to serve. Hebrews 9, 11 tells us uh, that we are, that God purged us from our sins, uh, right? Uh, how much more if the blood of bulls and goats and helpers, Hebrews 9 says, I'm out now, key scriptures on serve, Hebrews 9, 11. Uh, if the blood of bulls and goats, uh, uh, you know, for the help for the uh, uh, perfecting, sanctifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus purge your conscience, purge your conscience, Hebrews says, from dead work, so you don't even remember of what you did when you were in sin. How much more shall the blood of Jesus purge your conscience from dead works so that you can serve the living God. When your life wasn't hidden on nothing, you was broke, busted, disgusted, God brought you out of a horrible pit, and you say, God, if you ever give me another opportunity in life, in ministry, if you give me my health back, I will serve you for the rest of my life. But now some 5, 10, 15 years ago, you act like you don't forget what God has done. But I hear the Lord saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefit, who forgave you all your iniquities, heal you all of your diseases, crown you with loving kindness. Uh, I, I beg of you that by the mercies of God that you present your body in view. We talked about that last week. It's mercy that keep you presenting in view of all the mercies of God that you present your body uh, uh, as a living sacrifice. Psalm 103, we're going to say that he has not dealt with us according to our sin, but he remembers our frame that we are but just dust. So we must serve the Lord with gladness. I could spend a whole lot more time there on Hebrews 9:11 through 13 there. It's good stuff. Let's talk about shepherd serving now. I know we know how to serve the Lord. What about shepherd serving? If God gave you a gift as a shepherd, this worker's training for my sheep, I'm not talking about those. I got some good friends around the corner at 6th Avenue, Cantaloupe, and Dr. Wesley, and uh, doing great work there. Uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, over the hill there, we uh, Shiloh, and 
Greg Clark and, and those all of but I'm just talking about where you called to be. There are some other people doing some other ministries, and you're trying to help everybody, but workers training. Let's talk about what you call. Sweep around your own front door first, amen? Missing in action at the right place, at the right time. You send your children every day to the, every week to the same school. They don't decide one week, oh, I tell you what, we are, we are, we're not going to Jackson Nolan today. We're going to go with Winona. But next week, no, we're not going to Winona. We're going to go over, over to Hubbard. No, 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 no. If you understand stability, you send your children to the same school every week, don't you? Why in the world are you all over the place? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. All right, so John 10. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. I made a statement uh, on the last week about what worship is. Adam worshiped not because there was a great multitude. Adam didn't worship in Genesis chapter uh, number 2 uh, because, uh, because uh, there was a great band, a great talent. The Bible says what triggered and initiated Adam's worship, he would hear the voice of God walking through the God. The voice of God. I had come to the garden of God. He would hear God's voice. If you don't hear any singer's voice, any musician's voice, any preacher's voice, any intercessor's voice, this is a heavy truth here, it ought to be the voice of God, the fact that he speaks and the sound of his voice is so clear that the birds hush their singing. It's the voice of God. Psalm 29 says the voice of the Lord. When God is speaking, you ought to say, speak God uh, for your servant. List Now all the praise, all the worship. I know God's voice can be in a, a, a musician's voice and a singer's voice, but come on, this you got to drink this thing swipe, uh, st uh, straight up. The fact that God is still talking to you. Just the word alone ought to make you want to praise God. If there is no Band. If there is no singers, come on. Your worship should not go down a level. Now, there may be an adjustment because you're so used to doing that, but that's no different than working a six-figure salary job and all of a sudden you're drawing pennies. You know you're going to have to make some changes to survive. Amen. But it's the voice of God. No one can ever say in the 42 years that you come to more than Congress that the word of God was not sharp. As a matter of fact, it was more sharper than any two-edged sword piercing into the body of son or soul and spirit. Mary Joe is the word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your pathway. You're the one that says, open my eyes, God, that I may behold wonderful things out of your law. Psalm 1, the word of God has always been there. Amen. So we worship God because of the word of God. Amen. That's over in John 10. But here's one in Ecclesiastes 11, talking about uh, serving the shepherd. Uh, Ecclesiastes, that great book that says, how do we know if all this church stuff is vanity? Somebody said, man, going to church, doing the same thing repetitionally. If anybody do the same thing uh, at the same time with the same people with no result, with the same results, then by any by meaning uh, definition, that's insanity. I can see us coming together and praying and doing solemn assemblies uh, if there are no results. But how many Sundays we get reports of your faith and you see this word working? Okay, somebody said, well, a couple of people died. Well, how many people live? Somebody said, you know, we had a couple of funerals. Well, that's all. That. We don't want to get too adjusted to that. But how many people were protected the whole year? How many people were promoted the whole year? Get rid of that sin consciousness, amen? So we want to make sure that we understand that coming to church is not vanity. So Ecclesiastes, that we're getting ready to quote from, is called The Preacher. This is the book that uh, Solomon right, writes after he didn't listen to his father through the Proverbs. He says, vanity, vanity, meaningless, meaningless. What all this mean? All this praise, all this come together, all this uh, church cast, all of this, what does it mean? Well, it talks about, because somebody said, I'm just, I just got to go get it. I just got to go, go get it. That's chapter two. I got me vineyards. I got me stamp collect. I get it. Somebody said, man, I'm out here trying to get it, Pastor. You got, I'm trying to get it. That's exactly what Solomon, the area he made, he tried to get it, right? But he says, everything, there's a season. There's a purpose. There's a, a time and a season to every purpose under the heaven. But you be a line on line, precept on precept. You don't start getting it out there and leave your house undone. Hello. Right. So by the time you get to chapter uh, number uh, four, it says, whatever you find your hands to do, do that with all your might. Chapter four, chapter nine talks about whatever you find your hands to do in the house. But man, when you get to chapter 11, he starts talking about cast your bread upon the waters because who knows what evil is going to what happen to the earth, what is coming from the north, what tree is going to fall. You don't know what's coming. That's why you're casting your bread on the waters and giving a portion to seven, a portion to eight. You're giving tithes. 
You're giving alms. Uh, you're giving anniversary. You better read Ecclesiastes 11. It says you should be given a portion to seven to eight. You're doing more than that when it comes to the natural. You're paying the water bill, the light bill. Come on, somebody. The car note, the house note. You got about eight portions. Somebody say, well, all they do is take up all these offers. Well, you don't say that when you pay your bills and you get all these bills. You give them a portion of more than seven to eight. But if you cast that bread upon the waters and you look for seed time, uh, you're going to get a harvest no matter what evil Ecclesiastes 11 said, no matter what evil fall upon the earth, if you got enough seed in the ground, you will be covered and your living will not be in vain. But then he started talking about shepherds serving and masters of assemblies. Serving God in the house of God. Let's pick that thing up in Ecclesiastes. Is it chapter 12? Yes, sir. I got 11 on the notes there, but it's my bad. Now, that's my bad. I gave you 11, uh, uh, but, you know, everybody making mistakes. I'm like, man, uh, you know, my pastor, your secretary, make mis I have these mistakes. My fault. I'm making these mistakes. Mistake. I'm flying by the seat of my pants. I got, I got to try to, to, to take pictures of this thing and, and write and all kind of stuff. But this one here, uh, as they say, my bad, my bad. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 now, I think it is. Yes, sir. Verse 11. What does it say? The words of the wise are as gold. We saw that word gold in the earlier. They're like prodding. The words of the wise are the words as gold. Of, they're like ghosts. Prodding goes. He's prodding you. Somebody that's wise. That's wisdom is proven knowledge. I've seen, I can tell you a thing or two if you listen to me. The words of the wise. We're talking about these novices, these Johnny come lately. But the words of the wise are what now? Are as goals. As goals. Paul is hard to kick against the goals. And as nails fastened by the masters. Oh, shod. They are as nails. The, his words. Words by the wise ought to nail you. Fastened by the masters of assembly. By the masters of assembly. It's like Jesus. God told him he had to go to the cross. The father's words nailed him to the cross. He didn't like it. It was painful. But the words of the wise would nail you. But he knew that once Jesus got up off that cross, when he got through with that place that he did not like, all heaven would be given. Every knee would bow. There are as uh, by the words of the ghost. And they are called what now? Yes. Masters. Of assemblies. Of assemblies. Masters. Those that's preaching the word, they are masters of, they're not masters of social work. They are, have a master's degree and who, who goes what, what part of the body fits where. They are masters of assembly. What kind of assembly? Solemn assembly. General assemblies. Uh, when we come together, how we assemble. A Sunday school assembly. Fellowship. They are masters of assemblies. Now watch this. Which are given from one shepherd. They are given from what? One shepherd. How many? One shepherd. You don't need five shepherds. You don't have five husbands, do you? Come on, you ain't got five jobs. One shepherd. One shepherd. They are words coming from one shepherd. Masters of assembly come from one shepherd. And further by these, my further son. Further by these, if you decide that you want more. Well, this is my shepherd at 8 o'clock. This is my viral shepherd. And uh, this is my uh, hometown shepherd. Let me warn you. Let, there you go. Not suggest. Let me warn you. I just advise. Let me warn you. Be admonished. Be admonished. Of many, of making many books, okay. there is no end. No, you read everybody's book. Okay, you read what pastor said, you got a notebook of what pastor said, then you got what somebody else said. You, you're, under too, you're under too many voices. That's schizophrenia. A double-minded man. Somebody says, so you think you're it? God says by two or three witnesses, right? But you ought to make sure that those voices are approved and lined up with your house. Somebody said, that's egocentric. Isn't that what you tell your children that you're training, you're feeding, you're leading? No, they're not going to everybody, they're not eating off everybody's table. They're not bringing everybody into your house, and you tell them they can't go into everybody's house. You should not be in everybody's conference and everybody's prophetic movement. You should not be listening to everybody's iPod. It should be approved by. Come on, some credits do not take. If you're going to get a degree at University of Alabama, it don't matter if you went to Montevallo, Lawson State. It's not that they're not a university. It's just that their credits, their curriculum may not pass over. Some of the things that we hear, it just, it don't mean it's wrong. It just does not line up with what God is doing to you and doing for you. I think you understand that. Masters of Assembly, keep going. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. So much study. Well, all that I don't get from you, I'm going to live it over here on deliverance. I'm going to live it over here on prosperity. I'm going to live it over here. Much study in that case is what? 
a weariness of the flesh. Well, now all of a sudden, you're so weary when it's time for you to come and do what you're supposed to do. You've been so busy helping in the ark and everybody else's house. When he asks you to do something, you are missing. You are AWOL. I marvel, Paul says, that you are so full, soon removed. AWOL, right? Is that what Paul says in Galatians? That you are absent without leave. So now all this study, all this going, you happen over here, heaven, when it comes time for you to be the elder and the deacon to do what we need you to do, you can't be in your own house to help because you are serving two masters. You are so tired, you don't forgot, you done left your first love. Let's keep going. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Conclusion. So he's rebuking them about shepherd serving. Conclusion, fear God. I know that will help you. Now, Matthew 6, 24, shepherd serving. How do we do that? Matthew, the Jesus Sermon on the Mount, we already looked at that when he called his disciples, his climbing companion, when he was set, gave them the beatitude. Now, because we tell you, you can't be all over the place, you got an attitude. Oh, he controlled my life. Who he think he's a dictator. The Lord is my shepherd. We start talking about all that crazy stuff because we don't understand the body of Christ and how it functions. Amen? But watch what Matthew says in chapter 6. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters. No man, no man. I don't care who you are. No man, no man. We're talking about how to serve. You cannot serve two masters. Now, the, the hidden thought is you really can. You can serve 10 if you want to. But here's what he's saying. You won't be able to serve them effectively. Yes. You, you won't be able to, uh, Something's going to be lacking on one of them. I promise you that. No man, no man. I don't care who it is. No man, young man, old man, elder man, trust these men. A believer's man. No man can what now? Serve, Serve two masters. Two what? Masters. We understand ultimately. I mean, the, the obvious thought is Jesus is the king, but he's the king of kings. But you cannot serve two masters. Or what will happen? For either he will hate the one. He's going to hate the one. And love the other. Love the other. In other words, all of a sudden, he's going to start hating one of them and loving that one. Or what? Or else he will hold to the one. Well, he will hold to the one and, and despise, despise the, the other. other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, now, what he's really talking about here is even ma uh, money. Sometimes people are what's really driving their service. You want to know what's behind the root of all evil? Money is driving their service. Money. You cannot serve God and mammon. So if mammon going to be the driving force, your prestige and a title is going to be the driving force. It's going to affect what you're really supposed to be serving because you cannot serve God and mammon. It looks like you're trying to serve two men, but if you look at it in Timothy, what's behind that is the love of money is the root of all evil. And Forrest Gump said, that's all I got to say about that. Okay, so let's go on now into types of service. Types of service, because I think my time is probably going to run out. I want to do another lesson, but I don't think time is going to permit, so I'll prepare to land on this. All right, types of serves. Types of serves. There are five of them. Number one, observe, observe. to watch. Just to watch. Just to watch. Now, there is a place where we should be watching. Joshua 1 and 8, you can see it there, says, observe, OB, obstetrics, serve. This book of the law shall not depart. I got my Bible here. This book of the law shall not depart. This book of the law, this book right here of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you're to meditate on it day and night and observe to do. Before you start serving, you need to make sure that the one that's serving, that he's giving you the book, the book, the Bible. Observe to do according to all that's written therein. If you observe to do to all that's written therein, Joshua said, then you'll make your way prosperous. You won't have to be trying to serve two masters, and you will have good success, or you'll make wise deal. Amen? So we want to make sure that we understand that, uh, uh, that the kingdom of God is not just with observation. And I bless those of you that sit back, and, and you are, uh, you know, uh, I heard El Stewart say one time, there are two people. There are those that uh, um, watch it happen, and there are those that make it happen. And I'm glad that many of you can sit back and uh, it, it just bothers me. I just get this from far too many, especially leaders. They're always trying to correct people and tell them what went wrong and this is wrong. And I don't know what you're doing. What are you doing to make it happen? Because if you were doing what you need to do, you wouldn't have time to be watching everybody else. That's called observation. Isn't that just, just tragic? And isn't that a travesty? When people, I mean, they're doing their best. Oh, they hit the wrong note. Uh, oh, they had the wrong word on the screen. Uh, oh, they park them in the wrong section. Uh, oh, they, uh, you know, come on, man. I, we get that. We appreciate the constructive criticism. But at the end of the day, what are you doing? 
Are you, I mean, if I'm just sitting around, do you think you're the, the uh, what Daniel called chapter 5, a professional watcher? Just trying to watch everybody, who this one talking to, who this one trying to hit on, who this one didn't pay their time, how this one ran. Is that what you're coming here to do? Uh, is it just about observation? I hope not. How to serve. That's how not to serve. Number two. Deserve. deserve. Entitlement. Entitlement. What we deserve. Oh, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen a number of places. Uh, I was at a funeral not long ago, and uh, a person uh, got there, and uh, they just noticed. I won't call the name to protect the innocent. I've gone to way too many funerals in my life for you to know where, what I'm talking about. But anyway, they got up, and they were looking, and they were kind of like a, a senior person, and they didn't see their picture. They did not see their picture. I said, oh, my God. And they would let them know, wait a minute, how dare you not put my picture in? As long as I've been a part of this family, that's called entitlement. What you deserve. Just because you've been there for a while, don't nobody owe you nothing. Amen. Whatever you did, you did that for Christ. Now, we people should recognize. We should get honor. We should honor our mothers and our fathers. Right? They deserve that. But even parents, if your children never say thank you, you did what God asked you to do to train them up in the way that they should go when they're old. But if they don't come back and say thank you, there's no entitlement there. You, let, you leave that to God. God will deal with them. People, right, we, you don't want what you, um, somebody said, what you, you want to get what you really deserve? You know what we really deserve? I'm going to tell you, if we got what we, if you want to go out and start operating like that, well, man, with all that do, all this sacrifice, and all, every time they called and they used me here and somebody else, you want what you really deserve? I don't think so. Amen. You need to just say, Lord, I delight to do thy will. Whatever you need me to do, I'm willing to do it. And once I'm through, that is over. Let's watch that we not get into a place of feeling like what you deserve. Amen. Number three. Reserve savings. Savings. Okay. Peter says there are some things that God is reserved for you. That's good because many times in our jobs and life comes at us fast, our finances hit us, and we don't have any reserve at all. You know, there's a military, there's an army, and there's a reserve. What's the reserve? That's the backup. For those that uh, have been enlisted and active, those in reserve, they can employ them at any moment. You ought to be on reserve, ushers, even if it's not your Sunday singers, so that even if somebody did show up and we needed you to usher, we need you to sing, we need you to do something, well, it ain't my time. Now I, I only committed. Really? That, that's why you want to you start acting like God can't call you anytime? I thought you said that you will have your feet shod. You are ready. You are prompt. Remember, shod? You are prompt. You are ready, you are stable, you are anticipating, they just may need me. I know I'm a part of the usher team, the praise team. If somebody cannot make it at the last minute, I am ready. Well, bless me, God, they didn't give me no notice. I tell you what, what that, I mean, it just turns me off when people are asked to read the scripture, pray and sing, and they'll get up and say, well, please excuse me for a moment. You know, they asked me at the last moment, so bear with me because I can get no notice. What you mean you got no notice? You were supposed to be ready at all times. First Peter 3.15 says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready at all times to give an answer of the reason of hope. You should always be ready. Somebody say, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Every time you come to the house of God, you don't know. You should have a set of clothes just in case. You know, I bless God for the people. Uh, Anthony Nixon, Charles Williams, old people, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Elder Thompson, sometimes you hear lights going out and air going on. And I remember not long ago, man, our air went out and, and uh, it was one of them hot. And, and Anthony, you know, he's always sharp. I mean, I mean he's good. he got them rags, man. But he'll come in and change it to his Superman, go up on top of that building. No, that's not a part of Anthony's electronics or come up. They'll do whatever they find there. Elder Thompson is the same way. They'll move a tent, come in, put on the suit, put on the priest collar. But all you want is a priest collar. All you want to know, Pastor, are we going to wear the priest collars on the first Sunday? Are we going to wear the priest collar? You ain't asked about no priest collar no other Sunday. Why? Because we'll be grandstanding. I want to know, are you willing on a moment for us to call you on your off day? Can you respond quickly? Oh, this is my time. I know we're talking here. I know we're talking here. Amen to God. We're going to get ready to wrap this thing up here. So reserve. I don't know what we got. Five minutes. Talk to me. Conserve. Lay back. Okay. All right. You're saying, you're saying, come sir, wrap it up. Okay. I need to wrap it up. Okay. Conserve. I got to conserve. All right. Conserve. 
Uh, we got uh, only have so much time on Facebook. Conserve, okay? So we don't want to be too reserved. People come back, uh, they just lay back. Reserve, just lay back. I mean, they come back and they just watch it. They just kind of lay back. They want to see. I want to see how this is going to come out. I want to see. We got all kind of changes. I want to see how. Why don't, instead of watching to see how the church is going to go, why don't you make sure? Why don't you not be so laid back? Look like I'm talking to a congregation. I almost feel like I'm talking to a congregation. I keep talking like somebody in the building. I'm not half crazy up here. Almost like I'm talking to people over here, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I was talking to somebody over there saying, why y'all be so laid back? Why, if you think the finances, some people try to tell you, oh, you know, the finances ain't what it used to be. Okay, if it's that bad, how much are you going to do to bring it up? Don't tell me what the problem, you ain't got the solution. Be the solution to the problem. If we ain't got enough usher, you, you usher a few more. Uh, trustees, if we ain't got enough money, put more of your money in there. Don't just be telling me how, oh, pastor spent all the money and we came back, didn't take as much. Okay, then you up your offerings. You up your time. Don't be all reserved and laid back. I know I'm talking to everybody here. Amen. Conserve. And I'm about through. And the last one is. Preserve. preserve. I got to end this on that. I guess my time is up. Yes. Okay. Preserve. That's what we're after. How you serve. If you serve and do all the mother serves right, may the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. May he preserve you, your whole spirit, soul, and body. I probably talked much too long on this first night. The rest of the lessons I will do on tomorrow. Wednesday night, everybody from the trustees should be here. Elders, deacons, all workers, 300, almost 400 of you should be here. And if you're working, we understand. But outside of that, this is what we call boot camp trainers, workers train. I got to get out of here. Until I see you tomorrow, division of labor, you got to know these words. Satan is defeated, his darkness is spilled, and Jesus is absolutely Lord. Tell somebody, man, you need to hear the word that pastor taught tonight. It's been off the chain. Boot camp got my feet shod. God bless.